starting the uh, YouTube link now, which should be fine. I can see a lot of people joining us in the attendees list, which is really good. Okay. And we are live on YouTube, which is also good. Starting the uh, YouTube link now. Okay. There we go. All right. So I'm going to briefly just share my screen. And I think we're good to go. So I can see quite a lot of <laughs> interaction on the chat, which is always good to see. Uh, so I think we're ready to start. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Dimitra Fimi, and I'm here today wearing two hats. So I am co-director of the Center for Fantasy and the Fantastic, but I'm also one of the co-directors of the Games and Gaming Lab here at the University of Glasgow, which is just about right because this is a joint event. It is a collaboration between the Center for Fantasy and the Fantastic and the Games and Gaming Lab, as it combines uh, fantasy and um, um, D, &D and, and, and gaming in a, in a seamless manner. So today's event will actually be chaired by our amazing first year PhD student, Emma French, aided by a second year PhD student, Grace Worm, and you are gonna meet both of them very, very soon. Uh, and I really can't wait to hear from uh, my colleague and fellow Tolkien scholar, uh, John Ratcliffe in a little while. And um, John is genuinely one of the nicest and most supportive people one could ever work with. And I've been looking for an opportunity to invite him to speak to us. So I'm so pleased with, uh, we're hosting him today. You'll hear more about his background and his expertise from Emma later on. So my role here today is just to welcome everyone on behalf of the center and on behalf of the lab uh, before I pass on the button to Emma. It's absolutely brilliant to see so many of you from all over the world joining us uh, either on the Zoom webinar or uh, via the YouTube streaming uh, live this evening uh, or this morning actually as the case may be. I know for John it's morning uh, right now or afternoon you know, depending on where in the world you are. So as per our usual practice as we've done in previous events it would be lovely if, if people post um, where are you watching us from right now. You can watch what time of the day you can say what time of the day as well if you want but it would be lovely to get a sense of you know where you are uh, and how far uh, this event is reaching. Um, and you can do that if you're watching us on YouTube, you can do that by using the comment section as well. Uh, if you are live tweeting today or sharing any reactions from this event on Twitter or other social media, the hashtag to use is, uh, uh, is hashtag fantasy DND. I will put all of those in the chat in a minute and please tag at U of G fantasy and at U of G games lab. So, you won't see much of me uh, for the rest of this event. You'll see me again as we're wrapping up. And at the, towards the, the very end, I will give you the heads up on uh, uh, events to come uh, from the center and also information on how to subscribe to our new and more efficient uh, mailing list service. So for now, uh, welcome to one and all, and I hope you'll enjoy this event. So Emma, this is over to you. Thank you, Dimitra. And hi everyone, welcome again to D&D fantasy fiction, Giants in the Earth. Today we will be discussing the literary history and fantasy inspirations behind D&D. My colleague Grace, who has already been introduced, will be providing a brief introduction into what Dungeons and Dragons looks like today, either as a fun recap or an explanation for those of you who might have logged in knowing nothing about the game. We will then hand over to John D. Ratliff for his talk, Giants in the Earth, which will then be followed by a Q&A. Firstly, I would like to formally introduce today's participants, even though they've already been introduced once. My name is Emma French. I'm a member of the Fantasy Centre and a first year PhD student at the University of Glasgow. My project examines how Dungeons and Dragons has been used to consolidate our notions of fantasy, while also arguing that the game's structure of collaborative authorship now offers opportunities to challenge this. I'm a member of the GIFCON committee, a moderator for the Fantasy Centre Discord, and also have two cats named after critical role characters, which means that if either of them interrupt this talk, as I'm kind of scared they might, um, it's only to make very relevant contributions. Working alongside me this evening is Grace Worm. Grace is a secondary school English literature and rhetoric teacher in her second year of research on gender and legacy in Tomorrow Pierce's fantasy world of Tortle. 
She has, she's a long-standing dungeon master and games enthusiast. Grace currently leads the Intersectional Fantastica Reading Group, works alongside the center and bakes far too many cookies in quarantine. She's going to be introducing the basics of playing the current edition of Dungeons and Dragons, that's fifth edition, this evening, as well as discussing the game's increase in recent popularity. Um, finally, I would like to introduce our main guest for this evening, or his morning, John D. Ratcliffe. John D. Ratcliffe is an independent scholar best known for his work with the Marquette Manuscripts, which culminated in the history of The Hobbit, an edition of The Hobbit Manuscripts with extensive commentary. He has a special interest in the emergence of fantasy as a modern literary genre, and in the work of Tolkien's predecessor, Lord Dunsany. He is currently assisting in the reprocessing of Tolkien's papers at Marquette, and is converting what had originated as a monthly blog into a book of essays called Classics of Fantasy. In addition, John was, for many years, a role-playing game editor working primarily on Dungeons and Dragons. He is best known for co-editing the third edition of the Player's Handbook and Dungeon Master's Guide, and this created the basis for the D20, or 20-sided dice system, which Grace will explain in a second. He has also authored and edited such works as Night Below, Standing Stone, and The Reverse Dungeon. Therefore, today we are asking him to combine both of these areas of expertise in, into his talk, discussing how early D&D was inspired by and drew heavily upon fantasy literature. Before John begins his talk, I would first like to hand over to Grace for a short introductory activity, which we hope will give you a working understanding of contemporary Dungeons and Dragons and just how much fun it can be. So um, Grace, do you want to uh, share your screen? Yes. Um, so hello, everyone. Um, like Emma said, I am Grace Worm, and I want to welcome you all to the dungeon. Um, I hope you all came prepared. For the next 10 minutes, I'm going to be your dungeon master, leading you through the discovery of what Dungeons and Dragons is all about. You will have a chance to learn the basics, explore some of the reasons for the current resurgence of the game, and perhaps get a, game, a chance at the game yourself. I want to focus on the current edition, as Emma was saying, and show you some of the magic that happens in Dungeons and Dragons. So the version we'll be talking about today is fifth edition, or as it's known colloquially, 5e. Dungeons and Dragons is a tabletop role-playing game, or RPG, where players describe their actions through speech. The one essential book to play Dungeons and Dragons is seen here, the fifth edition D&D Player's Handbook, which includes pages of races and classes for players to build their character, rules for combat, role-playing tools, costs of items, spells, and general magic rules of the world. Most of the information is also provided online for free. There are many more books filled with incredible worlds, monsters, creatures, and interactions within the 5th edition universe that fill out an incredibly comprehensive fantasy universe. The continued success of D&D is guaranteed that tabletop role-playing games will remain firmly entrenched in fantasy, even while the market for other RPGs not set in a fantasy world expands. The company that produces Dungeons & Dragons, Wizards of the Coast, publishes everything from rules for play, playable races and classes, and adventures for dungeon masters to use. Though many dungeon masters choose to homebrew their own adventures, which means to use the rules laid out by Wizards of the Coast in their fifth edition of Dungeons & Dragons, but to create their own world and adventures. This means that DMs can create their own rich fantasy landscapes, not necessarily reliant on the world building of Wizards of the Coast. What makes this game so special is the ability for long-term character building and collective storytelling. This image is from a game of D&D I played with friends for over a year. This is similar to a typical setup for D&D, no matter what, you're, what game you're playing. Whether you've decided to play in a world similar to Tolkien's Middle Earth or a science fiction world of spaceships and space dragons, the basics look the same. This is DM. He has a privacy shield that keeps the players from seeing what devious plans he has in store for them, some colored pencils to help illustrate battle maps where distance is important, and dice. While the dungeon master or DM may have maps, monsters, mystery, or non-playable characters, NPCs, ready to face their players, games still typically involve a lot of improv and quick thinking from DMs to build a believable and compelling world for their players. As a DM, I can safely say that you'll never be fully prepared for everything your players decide to do, and that's half the fun. These are the players with their character sheets and dice. Character sheets are built using the handbook and tell a player what abilities, weapons, or spells they may have. The DM sets up the game using the rules outlined in 5e, 
He might say something like, you are all trapped in a dark room with no visible door or window. What do you do? Their character sheets tell them what abilities they have as their character. So maybe a wizard looks at her spells and says, I want to cast a light spell. While the cleric of the group says, I want to search the room for a hidden door. The DM then tells the cleric to roll their 20-sided dice and add that number to how good they are at the investigation skill, which is determined by their character sheet, to their roll. And then the DM has a number that they know will successfully pass the check. So for instance, the cleric rolls a 12, but they're really good at investigating, so they add two more points from their character sheet and tell the DM, I got a 14 searching the room. The DM, who has privately decided that anything above a 10 will reveal a trap door, proclaims that the player has passed their check and they find a dusty, dusty hidden door in the corner of the room. The game continues from there. This is the outline of every game. The players attempt to do something, anything, and I mean anything, within the world, then roll to see how well they complete their task using their unique character abilities, and then the DM decides on the outcome of the roll. This works for everything from trying to hit someone with a sword to attempting to charm a shifty bartender for information or to see how quickly they can climb a perilous mountainside. I've collected some character sheets from various players I've known throughout the years to give you just a sample at how intricate and complex the characters that people build are. You can see some of their character skills, items they've collected and abilities, magical or otherwise, as these examples cycle through. The love and joy of Dungeons and Dragons is in its collective storytelling and the DM's creation of an interesting and engaging story within their world and the player's abilities to use their ingenuity and role playing to work together as a group to move through the DM's world. If you've ever played an improv game with friends, you know the thrill of making something together that is uniquely your own and built together through your collective storytelling. My family often pokes fun at me for my nerdy habit of playing D&D for hours every weekend, but it's time with my friends in front of a table or screen engaged with one another with characters we've built up over sessions that can span years, collectively engaging and telling a fantasy story that we all love. You can see why so many people want to play, to delve into their character's backstory and motivations, to be excited to try out new abilities and spells, to delve into a character's growth as you gain influence and power. Your characters can also force introspection as you navigate difficult moral decisions, and as you play, move beyond a one-dimensional understanding of the fantasy world your characters inhabit. If you've never played D&D before, you don't have to jump into years-long games. You may not want to play a bard who only covers ACDC songs or a druid with hay fever long term. I know this fear often keeps new players away from the game. But the beauty of Dungeons and Dragons is that the character builds slow the character builds allow you to slowly build into a character over many sessions so you can start small and decide to grow or not from there. I regularly run one-shots or one-off adventures that are self-contained stories that allow anybody to try out the game or new characters that they may not want to play long-term. Technology also allows for digital dice rolls, digital maps, and quick build character sheets. Any internet search will result in apps and websites that will help you create a character, provide materials for DMs to use, like maps and monster statistics, that you can quickly pull out when your players decide to run blindly into a haunted castle because they saw something shiny. So hopefully I've given you a little flavor of what the setup of D&D looks like, but now I want to explore some of the reasons why D&D is making a resurgence in the past couple of years. The first reason starts with this edition of the game. Released in 2014, the fifth edition focuses on storytelling and less on the minutiae of the game. There's much less rigorous scorekeeping and complex rules than in previous versions. Chris Cox, the president of Wizards of the Coast, credits playtesting, free rules available online, and the focus on storytelling as the reasons for 5e's success. He said, I think that what they've come up with is not so much a rule set that you must follow, but more of a creativity engine that helps to prod great storytelling. Every year since the fifth edition's release has been the biggest year for sales of Dungeons and Dragons. One of the other major reasons for the resurgence in popularity, besides the change in rules that have made the game more accessible, is undoubtedly due to several popular Dungeons and Dragons web streams that further the sense of collective storytelling in the game. The first and largest of these is Critical Role, a web series in which professional voice actors play through D&D Live almost every Thursday, and games typically run between three to five hours long. 
Critical Role has had a total of 18.4 million followers over the years and have created over 1,000 hours of D&D content, and the success of their stream is unprecedented for tabletop games. The actors are certainly part of the success of the show. The current season has voice actors who are famous for their collective roles in games and TV shows like Overwatch, One Piece, Dragon Ball Z, Naruto, Persona 4, World of Warcraft, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and The Last of Us. As Alexandra Turney writes in her article profiling the group, not only are they great with improvising and voices, but their vast knowledge of the game and friendship with each other help make the stream so enjoyable. The fan community that Critical Role has created is extraordinary for the game and has been a large part of introducing new players to the game with skilled players and voice actors. One of the other popular D&D streams often credited with the resurgence of the game is the Adventure Zone Balance, po Balance podcast. This very podcast was the reason my friends and I first started playing. The Adventure Zone is run and played by the McElroy family of three brothers and their father. The family was already famous and well-practiced in the art of streams through their hilarious podcast, My Brother, My Brother and Me, which still runs today. The Adventure Zone balance starts with the McElroys learning to play D&D &D themselves, which serves as a great introduction to the game for new players. And it went on to become an incredibly successful podcast series, which led to a live tour of the family reprising their roles and a well-selling comic series with an introduction written by Patrick Rothfuss. Though it has been criticized for its sometimes loose interpretation of D&D &D rules, the Adventure Zone is held up not just as an amazingly fun way to learn about D&D, &D, but as an extremely engaging and unique fantasy story that is told through gameplay across years and through all the players, DM, and fan community. Many of their names, art, and ideas came from the active online community surrounding the podcast, and the collective storytelling happening inside the game was expanded to include the active fan community that followed them and began playing their own games. One listener, Mickey Quinn, who had their name used in the podcast, explains how much the show impacted her. Some of my best friends I met through the Adventure Zone because we all wanted to share our ideas about this beautiful thing. I think in today's media landscape, fandom is becoming more of a part of the actual experience of the medium, even though it's not directly inside of the media, because we experience things so socially these days. And I believe this holds particularly true in D&D, &D, which inherently invites collective storytelling. I'll say one last word about these marvelous shows before I move on. They are incredible for their storytelling and D&D &D gameplay. And I believe that they stand alone as fantasy stories beyond their gameplay within the Dungeons and Dragons universe. They really exemplify the amazing fantasy stories you can tell through collective storytelling and the depth of world building and characterization is difficult to emulate in any other medium. Now, you know a little bit about the game and I want to take a couple of minutes to encourage you to play. I've made some extremely simplified character sheets here versus the full character sheets that you saw earlier. There wouldn't be much to do in the game if these were your only options, but they will serve for our purposes today. Remember that once you have your character, you can attempt anything, not just the skills listed here. These skills are just what your character would be an expert in. So I'll take a moment and choose between rogue, wizard, bard, or cleric, and then we're ready to begin. Okay, hopefully you all have a character. You are ready. You and your party have heard strange rumors in Glasgow of an underground gang of goblins wearing a green armband who are terrorizing people in Queen's Park at night. You've been hired by the town guard to get to the bottom of the mystery and you have one lead, a half work woman who runs the bakery just outside the park was spotted with a green armband. Her name is Terry Fide, and she is a gruff, no-nonsense woman who, when she spots your, par your party come into her shop, shouts that if you're not here to buy, you need to get out. But you know you can't leave without finding out how she's mixed up in all of this. So go to the chat and write how you'd attempt to get her to talk, remembering that in a real game of D&D, &D, you would say what you want to attempt, then have to roll your d20 for me as the DM to tell you if whatever you tried was successful or not. But for today, use your character as a guide and inspiration and use your imagination. What will you do and how will you get her to talk? 
some lot of good ideas about buying food to butter up. Please continue to use the chat as you filter in your ideas about what you might do in this scenario. I think what's extraordinary about D&D &D is this simple scenario has already um, led to so many different ideas of how you would get her to talk. And that's just a little something of D&D &D I wanted to share with you today. So thank you all so much for listening and please get continue with your ideas because I'm loving some in the chat. Um, but I'm going to hand you all back to our lovely Emma and thank you all so much. Thank you, Grace. Um, I hopefully that gives people a working understanding of the game if they didn't already have it. I've already seen that quite a few people are talking about playing in the chat, but um, yeah, I love how many people just said, I buy food like a normal person. I'm a big yeah. fan of the non-murder hobo approach. That is what she um, said, <laughs> buy or get out. So that's fair. <laughs> um, so that was just a quick introduction to the game um, before our main event, which is uh, John's talk. So I'm just gonna hand over to him in a moment for an explanation of kind of Dungeons and Dragons literary history and how the game developed in the late 20th century. Um, as I said before, this talk is followed by a Q&A. What will happen is if you could put your questions that you have any that come up during the lecture, if you could put them in the Q&A box on Zoom or in the YouTube comments, we'll be checking both throughout the lecture. Um, and then I'll pose them to John after his um, talk is finished. Um, so I'm going to mute and hide my video now. So I'm going to hand over to you, John, directly. Thank you very much. Okay, my piece is called D&D and Fantasy Fiction, Giants in the Earth. A special points to anyone who knows why Earth is spelled that way. Dungeons and Dragons was heavily influenced by fantasy literature as is testified by the famous Appendix N, inspirational and educational reading found in the original AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide of 1979. What is perhaps more interesting is that D&D quickly generated fantasy fiction in turn. This reciprocity dates back to the very early days of the game. In this talk, I'd like to briefly trace the movement from fantasy fiction to D&D to game-inspired fiction. Part one, Roots of the Mountain. That fantasy fiction played a role in the creation of D&D I take to be self-evident. Particularly crucial elements were taken from or inspired by the work of J.R.R. Tolkien, Robert E. Howard, Fritz Lieber, Jack Vance, and Poole Anderson. From Tolkien came the demi-human player character races, the elves, dwarves, hobbits, later supplemented by the half-elf and the half-orc, both extrapolated from Tolkien. The non-Tolkienian gnome was added later, and perhaps for that reason has always seemed something of an odd man out. The very idea of a player character party is Tolkien's innovation. In contrast to the solitary hero, or the hero with the sidekick, or a damsel in distress with benefits of Howard and his followers, Tolkien provided a paradigm for characters of different races and different abilities or classes to join together to form an adventuring party. In the game, this takes the form of having their success depend on the degree to which the player characters can bring into play varied abilities of the different members of the party. No one character has all the abilities needed to survive and succeed. That is thus an essential part of the design. Gary Gygax, the co-creator of D&D &D and the dominant force behind its development, later denied that Tolkien had played any significant role in the creation of Dungeons and Dragons. Personally, I describe this distancing less to historical fact and more to the cease and desist orders he had gotten from Saul Zance's Tolkien Enterprises shortly after D&D debuted. At any rate, a Tolkien minimalist position is hard to maintain when even a quick skim of the earliest editions rule books reveal hobbits, dwarves, elves, ents, orcs, whites, giant eagles, Nazgul, and Balrogs. Indeed, early printings of the rule books explicitly attribute some of these characters to Tolkien, who they, while continually misspelling his name as Tolkien, such as the Orc, the White, the Great Eagle, and the Nazgul, or as it's later known as the Spectre. If Tolkien contributed the player character races and the player character party, 
then Howard's Conan stories and Lieber's Fofford and the Grey Mouser series provided a blueprint of what player characters actually do in the game. Exploring, fighting, encountering traps, discovering riches, encountering with, interacting with non-player characters, running for their lives and the like. From Vance and also perhaps John Belair's comes D&D's highly characteristic fire and forget magic system, a highly distinctive approach to spellcasting that requires planning ahead and is thus disparaged by those who want all options open to them all the time. Then there's the alignment system, another distinct feature of D&D that derives from either Poole Anderson or Michael Moorcock or more likely both. If this inherent evidence were not enough, we have Gygax at the time of the game's debut deliberately stressing the game's roots in and deep affinities with fantasy fiction. Quote, these rules are strictly fantasy. Those war gamers who lack imagination, those who don't care for Burroughs' Martian adventures where John Carter is groping through black pits, who feel no thrill at reading Howard's Conan saga, who do not enjoy the DeCamp and Pratt fantasies, or Fritz Lieber's Fofford and the Grey Mouse are pitting their swords against evil sorceries. Those gamers will not likely find Dungeon and Dragons to their taste, but those whose imaginations know no bounds will find that these rules are the answer to their prayers. We invite you to read on and enjoy a world where the fantastic is fact and magic really works. E. Gary Gygax, November 1973. Despite Gygax's reverse phrasing of this passage, it's clear that here he is saying, if you love to read Burroughs and Howard and Lieber and all, then this is the game for you. Part two, fantasy fiction's influence on gaming. This fantasy to gaming indebtedness was emphasized by TSR reaching out in its early days to contemporary fantasy writers whose work Gygax admired. The Dragon, TSR's house organ, launched in June 1976. In its early issues, published stories by Harry Fisher, who was Fritz Lieber's silent partner in creation of Fawford and Grey Mouser, and like Lieber had been a correspondent of H.P. Lovecraft's. Fisher was also a guest of honor at Gen Con, uh, TSR's convention in 1977. Lieber himself had been guest in 1976 at Gen Con 9. And in what must have been a bit of a coup from TSR, Lieber had allowed what seems to have been the first publication of a new Fawford and Grey Mouser story, Sea Magic, in the December 1977 issue of The Dragon. Similarly, L. Sprague de Camp authorized the reprint of one of the famed Harold Shea incomplete enchanter stories he had co-written 20 years earlier with the late Fletcher Pratt. The Dragon even ran serials by hack pulp writer Gardner Fox, uh, now of the Far Journeys, and by Gygax himself, who under the fairly transparent pseudonym of Garrison Ernst, essentially self-published a serial called The Gnome Catch, 1976-77. Debuting in the very first issue of Dragon, The Dragon, Gygax's picaresque tale ran in installments for six of the next seven issues, until it quietly disappeared in mid-story after the June 1977 issue. Despite its lack of any literary merit, it is historically significant in that had it been finished, this would have been the first D&D novel. And before moving on, I feel we should note this tale's final sentence is surely a contender for the oddest of Gygax's many odd constructions. Quote, great gods, expostulated the startled errant. It is a dwarf being pursued by a pack of giant toads and weirdly hoppy men, end quote. Part three, full circle. Things came full circle, fantasy inspiring gaming, which in turn inspired gaming fiction with the 1976 publication of a fantasy novel inspired by D&D, but written by a highly regarded professional writer, Andre Norton's Quag Keep. This was published by Donald Waldheim's Doll Books with a cover illustration by Jack Gagan who's best remembered now for having provided the covers for the unauthorized ace paperback to the Lord of the Rings. Despite Norton's somewhat shaky grasp of D&D's rules and tropes, her book takes pains to emphasize its affinities with gaming, as is testified by her acknowledgement. Quote, the author, that is Andre Norton, wishes to express appreciation for the invaluable aid of E. Gary Gygax of TSR, expert player and creator of the war game Dungeons and Dragons on which the background of Quag Keep is based. Examination of the book confirms Gygax's influence, which mainly falls in the realm of world building. Thus, the first, character, the first chapter is titled Greyhawk and is set in Gygax's great city and hence game world of the same name. The plot includes D&D 
game elements such as polyhedral dice and the D&D alignment system depicting the vast struggle between order and chaos, as well as some recognizably specific geographical names such as Blackmore, Erst, Jelf, Yucumbri, which is probably an early version of the Yeomanry, Kaoland, the Sea of Dust, and the Temple of the Frog. All these had appeared in the first two follow-up releases to the original D&D rulebook, Greyhawk and Blackmore, February and September 1975 respectively, describing Gygax's and Arneson's fantasy worlds. Quag Keep seems not to have made much of a splash at the time. So far as I can tell, it was treated as just another fantasy novel. But Gygax did not give up. By 1982, TSR had a book department working on Endless Quest Pick a Path books. Not until 1984 did they release their first novel, Dragons of the Autumn Twilight, conceived as a joint effort between TSR's book department, represented by Margaret Weiss, and the game department in the person of Tracy Hickman. So successful was this that some 200 Dragonlance books followed. And they've just announced the new trilogy by the original authors is currently in the work due out later this year. Even more successful, by my rough count running to over 300 novels and short story collections, has been TSR's Forgotten Realms line, especially the Dritz series by R.A. Salvatore. So successful was the TSR book line that by the mid-1990s, virtually every TSR game world was accompanied by shared world novels, which typically far outsold their associated game line. Dark Sun, Ravenloft, Greyhawk, Spelljammer, Mistara, the later Eberron novels, and even Buck Rogers books. Part four, A Permeable Border. I said at the beginning of this talk that D&D was heavily influenced by fantasy literature. And it's clear from texts like Guy Gates's foreword to the game's earliest edition that this was not happenstance, but by design. D&D is an open system. It does not just invite borrowing from fantasy fiction and film, but depends upon it. To put it another way, D&D is a way to quantify the imagination. Nowhere is this clearer than in the long running column that appeared in Dragon Magazine starting around issue 26 in June 1979 and winding down around issue 61 in May of 1982. Giants in the Earth was originally written primarily by the late great Tom Moldvay with Lawrence Schick and later revived by Roger E. Moore. A typical installment featured two or three characters from famous works of fantasy or legend. Vance's Cudgel the Clever, Burroughs' John Carter, Homer's Circe, The Four Lords of Demonland from Edison's Wormerobras, and many others, including, controversially, Tarl Cobbett from John Norman's Gore series. In each case, the character has been translated into D&D terms, fully statted out like a pre-gen character ready to drop into your ongoing campaign as an ally, rival, foe, love interest, or PC. John Peterson has written in his new book, The Elusive Shift, of how from those earliest days, D&D had appealed to two disparate groups, war gamers and science fiction fandom, both of which predated the creation of D&D, each of which had its own appas, fanzines, conventions, awards, and so forth. And part of that appeal is due to the ease with which works of fantasy like those listed in Appendix N could serve as templates for adventures, suggesting interesting monsters, quirky characters, intriguing plots, unusual magic, elements of world building, challenging traps and puzzles, extraordinary treasures, and more. Thus, in a given campaign, the adventure's ultimate foe might derive from a villain of a novel the DM just read. One of the PCs might be inspired by a movie the character likes. I have a hunch there was a significant uptick in number of people playing elves about the time Peter Jackson's Legolas debuted. One player might prefer the comforts of a traditional template like a halfling thief, Yet another may be rules driven and der derive from the player's urge, derive from the player's urge to play an unusual race class alignment combination. The setting might be generic Tolkien-esque with pockets of weirdly exotic. So permeable a system capable of absorbing material from such disparate sources results in an eclectic game world. It would be wrong to say plagiarism is our friend, but that phrase does capture something of the process of creative borrowing that if done well, serves as departure points for future games and systems. Coda. And here's where the uh, illo comes into play. Finally, I'd like to share an image from the past that I think offers a glimpse into the mindset of those in charge with D&D from its distant early days. So can you put this up on the screen? Yep, I'm doing that now, John. Thank you. Okay, there we are. 
This picture comes from the last issue of the Strategic Review, TSR's first house organ, the magazine that preceded and morphed into The Dragon. In the middle spread of its last issue, from April 1976, only a little over two years after D&D first debuted, are displayed photographs of the Dungeon Hobby Shop, later known as the Mail Order Hobby Shop. In the center top, we see Gygax working at his desk. Below him, his partner, Brian Bloom, works on a hex grid map. I'd like to draw your attention to the little piece of art directly to the right of Bloom, a sign pass pointing the way to various fantasy locations. And could you put up the second piece of art now? Greyhawk, Gygax's game world, and Blackmore, Dave Arneson's game world, are at the top and bottom, respectively. In the middle tier lies the sign for Tecabell, the weird world of M.A.R. Barker's published by TSR as Empire of the Petal Throne. But what's really interesting are the two remaining worlds, Lankmar, second from the top, the setting for Fritz Lieber's Fofford and Grey Mouser stories, and Middle Earth, second from bottom, which is, of course, Tolkien's world. This little sketch does suggest what, that Gygax and company drew no distinction between the literary worlds created by the likes of Tolkien and Lieber and TSR's fantasy game worlds created as a place for D&D adventures to take place in. These in turn would serve as sources and inspiration for the fiction TSR authors would create in the years to come. And that seems like a good place to stop. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so we've already got some questions coming through. Um, remember that you can put them in the Q&A box on Zoom or in the YouTube comments. We are checking both. Um, I actually thought as um, an icebreaker potentially because um, I'm quite interested in this whenever I meet someone who uh, plays or is knowledgeable about D&D. &D. Um, in your uh, talk, you talk about the history of D&D &D. But I was actually interested also in your personal history with the game and how you came to be involved in its creation. Um, so uh, what were your first experiences with Dungeons and Dragons and how did you come to play it? Um, that is my first question and then I'll move on to audience questions. Okay, uh, I was first heard about the game in February of 1980. Of all things, my mother told me that she said, you like this Tolkien stuff. You, I've heard about this game that people that like Tolkien like. So I found out people were playing at a local hobby shop in Fayetteville, Arkansas, went and joined in a session, was really hooked. And it was interesting because the first DM I had is still the worst DM I've ever had. Uh, a killer DM, we used to call them back then. Uh, the game got so fascinated me though that I played it on my own for the next 10 years and eventually got an opportunity when I finished up graduate school to work as an editor at TSR. So I was there as editor in Lake Geneva for five years. After that, I was came back and was out at Wizards of the Coast in uh, Seattle area for about another three years, then left and then came back one last stint for about another two and a half years up here, also here at Hasbro. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'm just, sorry, I'm just moving on to audience questions. Sure. Um, so, uh, I think this one is quite an interesting one because it talks about uh, how the game has kind of changed over time. Um, so one question from the audience we have is, to what extent do you think violence-based narratives have helped direct the mechanics to put combat as the focus of conflict resolution? Um, how, much, how do you think, um, because obviously in a fantasy novel, it's not always battle scenes, um, but in D and D, a campaign can just play out that way. So um, yeah. So, how do you think violence-based narratives have helped direct the mechanics to put combat as the focus of how you resolve narrative? I think I would say that it started as a game based on violence and has spent its entire history evolving away from that. It, it did begin as a war game. As a, this is a this is an interesting way to play a war game rather than playing large groups of people. You play individual people. So it, it does start literally from a violent confrontation, but people get interested in their characters and they get interested in the role playing. So the rules start adding victory conditions. You get XP not for killing the monsters or treasure, but for doing solving problems, set, resolving the situation. So the violence is a basic part of it. 
but it very early on ceased to be the the whole of it. At this point, I'm I'm not even sure if it's if it's the majority of it. Probably, it's still a pretty crucial part in D and D that you have combat with other foes. Yeah, I also think maybe the fact that video games can also have that um, kind of structure now. So if you want to just fight against things, you can uh, open up a fantasy video game, whereas D&D has more flexibility built in because it's a social game. I think that might um, also be a reason um, why there's been a shift, not to mention that the change in focus in 5th E has obviously been very um, influential in that choice. Um, a, a big it has had a big impact of new people coming in, playing games in new ways. That's been one of the best things about seeing the evolution of the last few years. More, more women play the game than ever before. And that's something that's really, really good. Yeah, and I think, um, as Grace said in her introduction, the fact that they're seeing people in Critical Role or Adventure Zone playing them as stories, that's also probably had um, an impact on the way that they think the game can be played because a lot of the appeal of Critical Role is watching them have a conversation in character or the relationships that they form as a party. So I think yeah. that is another reason why it's more role play heavy these days. Um, we actually had a question, I'm trying to find it in the document, about wargaming and the kind of, uh, sorry, I'm just looking through our document. So um, we were asked, um, uh, sorry, I'm just finding it. Um, so can you offer any insight into how or when war games and RPGs were differentiated and how RPGs became a genre in their own right? I know you touched on that briefly at the start of your talk, but um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on that uh, well, point a little. I think I can help on that by recommending a new book that just came out by John Peterson called The Elusive Shift, which is about when did the term role-playing become attached to games like D&D? Where did the where did the role turn where did the phrase role playing originate and how did it come to affect the way D and D was written and the way other games were written? So it's looking specifically at this problem of you start with war games and D and D on the cover says this is a war game. The little passage I read from Gagak says this is a war game, but it quickly becomes something unlike other war games. It becomes much more interested in the one on one. It becomes much more interested in the personalities of the characters. So. Uh, Peterson has been looking at early material, fanzines, other things from the 60s and 70s, and has tried to trace when did, when did war games become role-playing games. So I'd recommend checking out that and kind of using that as a starting point. Thank does you. That help? I was literally... Oh, sorry. Carry on. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Um, I've literally been reading John Peterson today, so that's... Oh. Fun, fun, uh, his earlier work, but I now I did that to my reading list as well. And I've seen that people in the chat have also um, appreciated that rec. Um, so uh, from Michael, we had the question, do hero parties in post-Tolkien fiction owe more to Tolkien directly or to the popularization of the trope through D&D &D and other RPGs? So do we think that the ensemble cast that makes a D&D &D game impacts uh, the kind of hero party in fiction, or is that still Tolkien's legacy? I would call that a both and would be my solution, that Tolkien created fantasy as we know it today, to an extent that we don't often appreciate. We just assume that there were things like groups of heroes in an adventure. Before. And that's really, you read the fantasy fiction, you really don't find that in the work of people like Howard and Lieber and others. You have the hero and you have sometimes the hero and one other person. And in Tolkien, you have these groups. So that's, you wouldn't have role-playing games as a one-on-one. -on -one. Well, you could. People just tend not to enjoy it as much as one-on group. Um, but on the other hand, once I didn't cover this in the paper, this would actually be the next paper, I suppose, would be once you have all of these D&D &D novels out there, people that grow up reading, playing D&D &D start writing their own novels. And sometimes they're not D&D &D novels, they're generic fantasy. And so there's a lot of influence from D&D &D into the way fantasy is written and read. 
which isn't obvious because they're not officially licensed D D, &D books. I was actually talking in the Fantasy Center Discord earlier today about books that we think would make good D&D parties. And I think, for instance, um, The Rogue, which can now be used in fantasy heists um, like uh, The Gentleman's Bastards and Six of Crows by Leigh Bardugo. I think those are very indebted to how um, archetypes were cemented in D&D, because I think the D&D rogue is something, one of the tropes that I think has come through in fiction quite a lot. Um, uh, so that actually leads quite well onto our next question, also from Michael, possibly the same Michael. Um, does current fantasy fiction continue to influence D&D? Um, also, is there any influence from other media sources like movies or comics? Uh, I think there's a tremendous amount of influence back and forth. That's what I was trying to say by calling it a, a permeable border that it's really hard to distinguish between what's inspired from one and what's inspired from another. So I, I think it's absolutely right that there's a lot of borrowing back and forth, but that it's, they are essentially merged at this point, I think. There are people that are writing their own thing off on their, off on their own. And those are the fancy writers I'm interested in the most are the people who don't fit in the, the more mainstream lines of fantasy because you never know what will pop out of somebody do, coming up with an interesting idea in an interesting world. Um, and on the topic, just in that question on new media, I think there is also like, um, as Grace said in her uh, PowerPoint at the start, Critical Role has introduced loads of people to Dungeons mm -hmm. and Dragons and Dungeons and Dragons and Wizards of the Coast would want to capitalize on that. So, um, they will create media franchises that will make them money. Um, and so that's why they might produce uh, books by new media, like the book that's the Explorer's Guide to Wildmount or the fact that Curse of Strahd kind of uh, came out around about the right time to capitalize on Twilight and vampires being a, a massive influence at the time. Um, so thank you for that question. Um, I actually had a question that kind of piggybacks onto that in my own notes that I made, which is, do you think that there are any fantasy trends or fantasy works currently being written that you would like to see adapted into D&D? Do you think there are any kind of new features to the genre that you think that could be added to the game? I think there's constantly new, I can't think of a good example off the top of my head, but I think there are constantly new and interesting things coming up in fantasy that people read them and say, oh, I want to play that character. I want, or the DM says, oh, that's a great setup for a scenario. And so the pieces get detached and absorbed into, into the game. And once they're absorbed into the game, their origins might not be that obvious that this came out of this computer game, this came out of this novel, this came out of this game because games come out of other games. Thank you. Um, so uh, the next question is on slightly different topic. It's from Kevin. Um, it's a bit long, so I apologize if I uh, say this um, in an odd breathing. Uh, so the notion of inherently evil races in Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy is seen as problematic today, even when there is an explanation for it, such as the drow's corruption by their devotion to an evil deity. How does the panel think this shift in attitude and the avoidance of this trope will shape future D&D and fantasy literature. So how do you think the kind of changing attitudes around race might first influence D&D &D and then maybe change the way that fantasy is written as well? I think it will have a huge imp impact and a huge influence and I don't think we'll know what it will be until it works its way out. That people are, are tackling it and it's, a, it's hard to see there from here. That we know we want to go there but, and we know sort of how we need to get started, but what all will happen between, we'll find out when we get there. Um, I did notice there was some new Unearthed Arcana released earlier this week, uh, Gothic backgrounds or something. And they've, again, built on the kind of Tasha system of changing race so that there are biological traits and cultural traits separately, which I know that was something that, um, was brought in by Arcanist Press first. So I think they are kind of 
fine tuning how that's going to work in the D&D canon. And I am quite, I, I mean, I quite like the idea of being able to play a drow that doesn't have to uh, worry about sunlight. So I think it's an interesting way to approach um, those kinds of characters. Um, okay, this one is from Owen. Uh, I would love to hear how the game itself compares to the creative process of writing fiction. How is the game itself like or unlike literature? Um, I, is, I um, mean, you also edited um, RPGs, so I guess that's another kind of, you've edited manuscripts and you've edited RPGs, so that's another way to approach that question as well. I think that people, let's see if I can put it coherently. Um, I think RPGs are a separate thing. They're not a branch of literature. They're not a branch of film. They're not a branch of anime. They are their own art form. And actually I enjoy reading adventures. I will sometimes buy a D&D &D adventure or a Kazuhu adventure and just read it like a work of fiction. I just enjoy reading it for the plot and characters. Um, so I think that this is, a, it is an art form. It is its distinctive thing. It's judged by its own, it's better to judge it on its own merits. Um, that actually means I can sneak in another one of my questions, which Good. is totally not uh, motivated by my own PhD project. Um, uh, so I, I think you've just touched on this, but um, Dungeons and Dragons is often kind of seen as formula fantasy, like the fantasy as formula as Brian Atterbury described it. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's accused of being derivative, like um, your talk talks about uh, how there were obvious indebtedness at the start. Um, so as a Tolkien scholar first, perhaps, I was actually, I would love for you to um, maybe elaborate on the kind of unique traits you think D&D has as a form of fantasy. So like it started off quite derivative, but how do you think it's evolved to have its own unique selling points? Um, I have a friend who describes D&D &D as the modern pulp fiction. And I think there's a lot of truth to that, that it's its own category with its own superstars and its own traditions. So that now you read a shared world book and you don't think, oh, that's a lot like Dunsany. You think, oh, that's a lot like Salvatore. That's a lot like Hickman and Wise. That at some point enough people do it, it becomes its own genre. It becomes its own established category that people seek out. And uh, I think that's a good thing. I think that shared world novels are an interesting phenomenon. When they're too derivative, I don't enjoy them. And that, that is a problem that some, when you get a pulp fiction or an equivalent to it, you get people in there that are just tossing them off. I made a sliding reference to Gardner Fox as an example. Um, but you have other people working within pulp fictions who do work that we still read decades later because they're good in and of their kind. They capture something you can only get through that kind of fiction. Uh, does that answer it? Does that help any? Yeah, that does. And I think um, bad, bad pulp fiction is predictable, right? And oh, I think yeah. the, the, the thing about Dungeons and Dragons is that that unpredictability is one of its uh, strengths. So you, I think I agree with you on uh, what you've just said. Um, so say that from... I've, never seen a, I've never seen a satisfactory definition that would leave out works of, ver works of art from a D and D novels, shared world novels that you could distinguish. This is good. This is bad because of this category. So there's good and bad in each of those categories. Um, so uh, our next question is from Caroline. Has the very systematized rules-based approach to D and D been a positive influence on fantasy fiction, or has it forced us too far down a path of wanting to understand the kind of world building and rules of fantasy worlds? Um, which kind of leads on from the previous question. Um, I guess I would say that if you're not original enough, then the, that's a problem. But there's nothing wrong with just tossing off something that's a lot enjoyable, light read. A lot, a lot of what most of us read most of the time is, you know, enjoyable, light fiction. Um, but you should be ambitious too, that taking the uh, standard D&D &D novel and 
finding something really interesting in relation between characters or setting. Those you, you cherish when you come across the really good ones. Um, uh, from Eric, I know there is a long tradition of science fiction themed role playing games such as Traveller and Gamma World, but they never seem to they, they never seem to come anywhere near the reach of D&D and other fantasy themed games. Science fiction arguably had a bigger reach in the 20th century. So why is it not, why does it not have a bigger role in role playing games? This is one of those puzzles that people look at gaming and say, I see why fantasy is so popular, but why is science fiction not more popular? And the, the best guess that I've seen is Fantasy is united by the fact Tolkien is such a dominant force on 20th century fantasy, modern fantasy. Um, science fiction is not unified by the same way. There is the Star Wars. There are others like Asimov, there's Heinlein. There's so many different science fiction leaders that science fiction isn't unified behind one particular author, one particular type of science fiction. So there have been a string of successful science fiction games, but there's never been one that dominated the way D&D did. Um, that's also true of some other genres like horror is probably the next biggest genre in role-playing games. You have games like Call of Cthulhu, which have survived a very, very long time now. But you also had Vampire, which was a very different game from Vampire the Masquerade was a very different game from Call of Cthulhu. You had Chill. There hasn't really been a unified horror game either. So I put it down to Again, it's Tolkien is su such a big light in the room, it dims other lights. That's a really good point. I, I, that's, I, I think that's really interesting, um, especially given uh, the fact that, as you say, um, the role playing games in, in other genres have not been able to dominate as much as D&D has been able to dominate fantasy. Um, so this next question is from Megan. Uh, some refer to D&D as a therapy of sorts, using their characters as a way to address real world issues. Uh, what do you think about using the game in this way? I think people do it. I don't think there's a problem with it. I don't think it's any different than going bowling and feeling satisfaction when you smack down the bowling pins. Um, you're releasing tension, you're enjoying yourself, you're doing, you're usually do it with, out with your friends sharing an activity. So. I think that uh, people that play the games know the games are games. And that people who want to criticize the games often lose sight of the fact it's just games. It's just a way of letting off a little steam. Um, I know from my personal lockdown D&D experience, I find something quite uh, empowering about being able to have agency in the world in a, in, during quarantine. I quite like being able to change the world for the better and face problems that I can fight. So that's my current way of using D&D as therapy, uh, just to uh, feel like I can enact change. I like um, that. <laughs> uh, so our next question is from Zach. Uh, for John, Lord Dunsany, sorry for saying it wrong earlier, Rob, is listed among the authors in Appendix N of the AD&D Dungeon Master's Guide. What, yes. if any, was the influence of Dunsany on D&D? Directly, it was very small. It was the borrowing of the Knowles. And you can tell that they didn't, weren't, they didn't know a lot about Dunsany because they spelled his name Sunsany in the original printings of the uh, first edition. The thing is, Dunsany was like T Tolkien before there was Tolkien. He, everybody read Dunsany, everybody was influenced by Dunsany, but by now he's been forgotten and replaced by the people he influenced. Uh, one example of Dunsany's influence is the first person to ever come up with a fantasy pantheon of his own gods. Lovecraft got the idea of the Cthulhu mythos from Dunsany. Tolkien got the idea of the Valar from Dunsany. So there's a level of deep influence, but when you come to the more surface thing, like player character races, no, that doesn't come, that comes from more modern sources like Tolkien. So Dunsany kind of establishes, this is all, these are all the things you can do in fantasy. These are all the different directions you can go, all the different kinds of stories you can write. It's a very pervasive and diffuse influence. I do recommend reading his short stories. Dunsany wasn't much of a novelist, but I don't think anyone's ever bettered him on the fantasy short story. And uh, 
they're short, they're enjoyable, give it a try. That was my evangelizing for the for the cause. <laughs> Um, thank you for that. Um, sorry, I'm just going to our document again for audience questions. Um, oh, this one's interesting, especially after the question about Dunsany. Um, is pre-D&D fantasy literature somehow qualitatively different from fantasy literature produced after D&D? Um, what are your opinions on that particular question? My, my opinion is that there's always been superlative work that's come out of nowhere over the decades. You can look at the 20s and there's works that seem to be self-contained like Blood in the Mist, nothing else quite like it. You look in the 80s, there are books like uh, The Bridge of Birds, really amazing book, nothing quite like it. There's The Golden Compass more recently. Um, I, don't, I don't think we've written ourselves out as fantasy, as a genre. I think there's, it's just we don't recognize the new masterpiece when it comes along. It's hard to recognize this is a book people will still be reading 40, 50 years from now. When it, it's not necessarily evident when it, when it first comes out that this is one of the keepers. This is a new, this is a classic. So I don't see fantasy as having had a, a sharp start, a sharp close. I think we're still in the middle, uh, at least if not toward the early end of fantasy story. There's still a lot of good fantasy to come that we can't even imagine right now. We'll know it when we see it. Um, so uh, my next question is, um, you worked as an editor and designer for role-playing games, as we mentioned um, multiple times. Uh, how do you think your experience as a fantasy academic informed your contribution to those projects? So what kind of aspects of a role-playing text do you actually critique in the role of an editor? Um, I'm interested in that part of the process. Um, a role-playing game editor is not what you tend to think of as book editor. Uh, basically, you have the designer who writes the product. You have the editor who does everything necessary to get it ready for publication. So there might be a project that comes in that all it needs is a light editing. There might be projects that come in, it's like you write material to fill the gaps. The designer didn't complete the design or parts of it aren't publishable. And so the editor will actually write the missing material and make it fit in with what's already there. So editing in a role-playing setting are, is a, there's a wide branch of things that come into the category editing. At simplest you get, you do copy edit and proofreading. At the hardest you write parts of the, of the uh, project. Um, so there's a lot more, I guess you'd say empowerment of the editor. One, having said that, you have to be very careful not to overdo it. If you replace something by the author, it better be for a really good reason, that you don't want to smother the author's voice. You don't want to smother the author's idea. Ideally, you want it to sound, you want the author to sound more like themselves when you're done with the editing. You want it more consistent. You want it to sound more like themselves. Uh, if there's a product that came in that I was working on that had a problem, I'd usually go to the author and say, there is a problem. You promise this at this point, but you never actually have that later in the article, in the piece. You, know, you say you're going to do the X and you haven't. How do we handle that? Um, I remember one case editing the adventure Night Below, that it starts when the characters, a friend of the characters is kidnapped and they follow that person's trail as a way of getting into the adventure. And further down, they find, you know, they keep finding little sort of breadcrumbs. Arnie Sacknesson was here, except the author forgot about this character. About halfway through the thing, all the references to this character disappear. There are no more references to what became of her. And it's like, this is very unsatisfied to the people who play. So we inserted a few later references and people could find out what actually became of this character they've been looking for. But we couldn't consult the author because the author had moved from England to America and left no forwarding address. So normally making a change like that, we would have consulted the author. In this case, we just had to go with what, what we thought made the best product. That's a bit of a long answer, but does, does that get it? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting answer. So are you saying that as an editor, you were um, more critiquing on the basis of narrative rather than like world building or consistency? Or was it a mixture of the two? Was there um, a stress on one or the other? A mixture of the two. Occasionally you just find a line, it's like, oh, that's going to be a problem. 
Uh, there was a lot, we mentioned drow a little earlier. There was a line in one product that said the drow skin turned dark to reflect the evil in their hearts. I went to the author and said, do you really want to say that dark skinned and evil are linked? He said, oh my God, no. So we took that out. That never saw print. But, you know, quite innocently, we almost pulled a pretty embarrassing statement. So it's all over the place, I'd say. You do what you need to do in the time you have to, to make it as good as it can, but you don't want to smother it with, you don't want everything you edit to sound like you, you want it to sound like the people who are writing it at their best. Thank you, that's a really interesting answer to that question. Um, uh, so I have uh, a couple more questions um, and then I don't know if anyone wants to add anything else to the chat box, but we seem to be coming to the end of audience questions. Um, so my last question is, um, do you think fantasy functions differently in a game setting? Which is quite a big question, um, but I'm interested, for instance, in the way that magic functions in D&D &D versus how Tolkien in, in, in of fairy stories talks about what magic should be, which is this very ephemeral um, force. So how do you think fantasy is different in a game to a novel or another work of fantasy? I don't know. Uh, to, be, to be honest, I, I see a lot of similarities, a lot of connections. Someone else that looks at it might see the differences instead. It might be that it depends on what your focus is and what you're looking for. I think there's a lot of influence from fantasy as a whole, including the new and the old. Um, but if you look at it distinctly, books like The Rook, uh, The Rivers of London, some of these new fantasies that have come out in the last decade, uh, they're quite different from the old Tolkien and Edison and Dunsany. So I, I don't know. I'll be interested in seeing and finding out. Yeah. Am I allowed to use my uh, host's prerogative there, Emma? Will you will you allow me to interject for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Um, I just I just I was fascinated by by um, the editorial uh, um, work that John was describing um, a minute ago, and I was also thinking about John as an editor of Tolkien's own words. You know, when you were doing the work on the history of the Hobbit, and you were presenting to scholarship different versions of bits of the story. You know, would you say that there's you know, there is a similarity there to, you know, looking at drafts and where the story could have gone or where the story, you know, clearly we're talking, we've got a finished product, right? Although he did change The Hobbit, you know, uh, we have a, ret a retcon situation with the whole chapter changing later on. But is it really that different to this idea of having possible routes towards where the narrative goes in a D&D in a game? I don't know. I think that's a great question. I don't know, again, I don't know the answer that in the case of Tolkien, you're looking very carefully to represent exactly what Tolkien said. It's how, how a classic came to be. But you do get that in some of the things like John Peterson's work and other books of its kind that are coming out recently. Of people, how did role-playing games come to be the way they are? How did D&D come to be the way they are? And it turns out there are actually answers to some of those questions. There's actually documentation going back to the contemporary time um, it is, a, I guess it's odd, odd in a way, the fact that I worked as a teacher for so many years that, as a teaching assistant, where you read students essays and you, you go through and try to point out this would be better. Here's what you're trying to say. You try to make them say, help them say what they want to say, help them, help them get across what they want to get across. That's really not that different from picking up and editing a piece, an, es an essay and saying, in this adventure, I can see what you're getting at this part gets in the way what what can we do to get that what make it the way you want it to be so really ed, grading student papers turns out to be really good practice for editing people because you're trying to bring out what the author wants to do what the author wants to say even if he or she hasn't quite said it yet but in some ways you know again reading back to your history of the hobbit which is an absolutely you know indispensable resource for for talking scholarship you know you do at times present possible ways you know towards where the narrative would have gone and you do have your commentary there where you say well this wouldn't have worked or maybe this could have worked you know there is still an evaluation yeah. there isn't there of course we have a finished product but 
there's sometimes when you when he stops something, it's like, why did he not go? That was really interesting. That why did he not go further? And you sit back and say, oh, okay, he must have realized if you do this, there's this and this and this. And it's like, oh, that's too bad he had to do that. But I see why. Sometimes you can't guess. It's just the author decided to do it differently. But you're right. You're trying to trace through the, the thought process of a very well-known story, which is different from trying to uh, discover this what happened with a less known story. Or maybe, or maybe arrived, arrive in a D&D game at a story that might be considered fixed or might be played sim uh, differently the other yes. way around. I don't know, I mean, all of this process always reminds me of actually Tolkien's day job, which was, uh, you know, being a, a professor of medieval, uh, you know, of, of, of old English and medieval English language and literature and, and how oh, medieval yeah. romances work. Because medieval romances have dead ends unfinished bits, bits that don't fit with anything else, you know, all of those elements that don't quite add up, you know, they're, they're not coherent, they're not consistent. Um, and, you know, there must be that, you know, there is that frustration when, when you deal with a text like that. Uh, and that would have been Tolkien's everyday sort of experience, which, again, isn't that different to how a d, &D narrative might, might, um, I'm stretching it a bit now, but yeah, what do you think on that? Absolutely. That Tolkien, medieval English, there is the famous book, The Lost Literature of Medieval, medieval England. And Tolkien once made a reference, I think in regard to Gawain and the Green Knight, that we weave our histories over very tenuous bits of evidence that are all that have come down to us. So you're dealing with incomplete fragmentary material and making the best sense you can out of it. Yeah. And some people are very confident of, yes, I know what this what this old English scribe meant to say, and I'm going to make it say what it what he should have written. Other people are more like, possibly he meant to do this. Well, maybe these two lines are swapped. Maybe they're inverted because the story makes so much more sense if you do it this way. Tolkien is of a generation that had extreme confidence in its ability to read medieval texts and rediscover those gaps, fill those holes. I think that was a huge part of his inspiration as a writer, as a writer, as an author. I think you're absolutely right about that. Great. Um, and I can see, sorry, but Emma, um, I can see some more questions now. I, I don't know if we have a different view of the questions, which is completely possible. Um, there's a lot, I mean, I can, I'm seeing that the chat is going completely mad, John, here on the side. You know, there's so much discussion going on. It, it's yeah. sort of dizzying, really. I, I haven't followed it all. Uh, but I, apparently, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Matthew Sangster, is saying that there's um, a lot of reading recommendations going on in the chat at the moment of what uh, what uh, fantasy works um, people would like to read, especially if they're interested both in fantasy and and D&D. &D. Uh, what would be your recommendations? And that, that's where I'm going to shut up then, Emma, and, and I'll... I don't think it would surprise anybody that knows me. Tolkien would come at the top, and Dunsany would come right after him. That, and you uh, also talked about, um, and I know you've been keeping up with sort of recent fantasy as well, so recommendations from sort of, I know your cats are named after particular characters in particular yeah. recent fantasy works. Lady Tyburn from the Rivers of London by Aronovich. The, it does surprise me that you think of classics and fantasy, you think of things that go back a century, but there's things being written right now that I think have a good chance of standing the test of time, like uh, Jonathan Howard's Johannes Cabal detective, uh, some Philip Pullman, the, uh, the Rook by Murray, Murphy. Um, they're just, every time fantasy looks like it's written itself out, that it's gotten into a rut, somebody comes along and does something really amazing, approaching things from a new direction. It's like, wow, why, why would, did no one do that before? Well, because he or she wasn't writing yet. So that's, when I see things and I get the feeling that there's too much generic fiction, I think there's always been a lot of generic fiction. There's nothing wrong with it for people who enjoy it. It creates the environment that makes possible, it put, makes the shelves in the bookstore that make possible the, the really masterpieces to get published, to find a readership. Great, thank you. Uh, I'll disappear for a minute, let, let Emma continue. So sorry for interjecting, just, I, I got far too excited here, so I'll just go. Absolutely no problem. That was a really interesting a little add-on. Um, uh, so we have- If people oh, can't sorry. remember how to, if people can't remember how to pronounce Dunsany's name, that 
a nickname he was given without his knowledge was Lord Insaney. Yeah, I think um, Rob also put that in the chat, so um, I apologize for getting it wrong earlier. Um, uh, so we have had a few more questions. Um, we're going to be running until 7.30, so I think we have enough time to get through some okay. more of these. Um, still got more tea. <laughs> um, uh, sorry, I'm just... Uh, um, there are many types of fantasy role-playing games, and yet D&D for a long time has been seen as the role-playing game. Do you think there is anything that is unique to the Dungeons & Dragons system that encourages this widespread following? Um, was there anything specific about D&D as opposed to other tabletop role-playing games that you found are, is like a unique selling point? Um, I think D&D is a better game than people give it credit for. That a lot of people say, well, D&D is okay, but my game you know, takes into account changes of decades. D&D has an amorphous quality that is able to absorb good ideas and take them over into itself. So D&D is not I think one reason it survives is it's hard to come up with fantasy scenarios that you can't play with D and D. There are there are other non fantasy games. Again, I'll mention Cthulhu, Pendragon was a good example, where people come up with a whole new rule set to match a whole new style of playing for a whole new subject. But for generic fantasy, I think D and D is hard to beat because, as I said in my talk, it's permeable. It's it's supposed to be. How to take that great anime character you just read and, and play her in a novel, play her in an adventure. Uh, D&D is meant to be open-ended. It's meant to be an open system that borrows from everything. And that makes it hard not to, to come up with something that you can't play with D&D. So I think that's why it survived is the fact the game now is quite different from the original game, but it's recognizably its descendant. And that open-endedness is still as as dominant as it ever was. Yeah, it's very flexible and adaptable and does kind of change to reflect, um, as you say, kind of the popularity of things like anime or manga and um, for instance, vampires or uh, with the, the kind of Eberron books, Fae um, mythology as well. Yeah. Um, this question is really interesting. It's from Anonymous. Um, was the concept of secondary worlds an essential aspect to the development of D&D? Or was the urge to feature um, within the storytelling people as themselves in reality, the primary world entering a secondary world, um, was that a deliberate choice? Was there an urge to feature that as a kind of almost portal fantasy that you enact by playing the game? I have to posit, I, was, I wasn't there, so I don't know this firsthand. My impression is that world building is something that just happened. That they come up with a game of, this is how to play your characters. This is how to give personality to these figures. The role playing is a big hook. The open-endedness of it is a big hook. The world building, I think, took them by surprise. It's like you have to have some place to, to adventure in. So you, there's two ways to world build. You can start with God creates the cosmos then the gods do the world and then you get the continents and then you get the history. The other way is there's, you're in a village with several other people at a bar. You meet, you hear an adventure, you go out. Most D&D world building is actually that second part. You start very small, very local, this group of people in this place. And they go over there and have an adventure and come back. And the world gets bigger each time they go out there and have an adventure and come back. So world building becomes part of the story without having been anticipated by the people who create the game. And it's one of the most interesting parts of the game is how much D&D does correlate to the world building that's such a big part of fantasy itself. So my, my guess, my impression of looking at things is that world building is crucial, but it wasn't planned. It, it just happened in and of itself as the way the game works, it encourages that kind of creativity. Yeah, I would definitely agree. Um, sorry, I'm just uh, looking through the questions. Um, uh, we've already had the question asking you about um, fantasy reading lists. 
but um, someone actually asks for Lord Dunsany specifically. Do you have any works of his that you would absolutely recommend as an introduction to him as an author? There are three short story collections he did back to back that I think read it, just reading it through all three it gives you a really good idea of what Dunsany's doing. The first is called A Dreamer's Tale in 1910. The second is The Book of Wonder in 1912. And the third is called The Last Book of Wonder in 1916. They're very quick reads. A lot of Dunsany stories are only, uh, you know, eight, nine pages long. They're, he wrote almost all of his stories in one sitting. He said he would, he would sit down with the idea, he would write the story, and he wouldn't get up until he was done writing it. So they, they tend to be like watercolors, very quick little impressionist sketches. If he got a second idea, he'd just write a second story rather than go back and revise the first one over again. So I would recommend those three, A Dreamer's Tales, The Book of Wonder, and The Last Book of Wonder. If you only have time for one, I'd say The Book of Wonder. That, that collection kind of gives you what Dunsany is doing. Okay, um, Matt has a question, which is, how did the experience of editing D&D change your relationship with the game as a player? Surprisingly very little, because one thing I discovered when I came to TSR is we're all gamers. So you would edit on a game, you'd arrive, you'd spend your day, lunchtime you'd go into the games library and play a game with your fellow designers and editors, then you go back and work some more. You'd work it if you were busy in the weekend if you were behind on deadline you'd take work home with you so people would game all the time and they would game D&D all the time but they would also play every other kind of game so this was one part about TSR that was very admirable is there was a camaraderie and there was an extreme enthusiasm for games of all kind and having it's Playing games with people who create games is an interesting experience. If you have, ever have the chance, I recommend it. That, that creativity is a lot of fun to watch firsthand. And they probably element of experimentation of being a play tester and an editor is probably an interesting um, perspective to have on the game. Um, that question leads into um, a very good kind of lighthearted note to finish on from Megan, who's been very patient with this question because it was one of the first ones in the chat. So do you have a favorite race or class to play? Do you have a favorite player character um, that has a place in your heart? Um, I, it's not that I have like a single character. It's more like I have an ensemble of maybe like a half dozen favorites of over the years. You know, this character is a really, I really enjoyed playing this character. I liked for different reasons, this character. So it's not a single character or a single type. It's more like there's a small ensemble. Of, these are the characters I enjoyed the most that I look back on them fondly. Do you have a particular kind of play style that you prefer? Would you go more towards um, kind of martial classes or magic users, or has it just been across the board? Have you tried everything? Magic users, uh, thieves, rangers, Currently I'm playing a Dwarven, bar a dwarven Druid. Uh, that is, a, I should mention that I, I still game, I am luckily in two games a week now. One, a Cthulhu game where we're playing Mask of Narlathotep, which I've always wanted to play all these years. And one, a D&D game where we're playing through one of those giant mega dungeons that have been coming out the last few years. Uh, it's interesting. But no, I couldn't say I have a single character, a single class, or single race. Um, but then that's kind of a thing about D&D is you don't have to have a single thing you like about it. It's a diverse game, which appeals to a diverse audience that people play for different reasons. And I think if it, come back to that question from earlier, that is one of the great strengths of D&D is very different styles of play people get very different things out of it. there's not a single reason people play and enjoy the game it's large it's like saying i enjoy movies it's a big category with a lot of appeal does that help <laughs>
Yep, sorry, I was muted. Um, I also think that might be a strong note to end on, as Grace has put in the chat. That was a really well put final kind of closing statement. So um, I think Demetria um, is going to come back on just to close up and have any announcements from the uh, centre. This was actually a very, very nice way to end, wasn't it? That D&D are like movies. You know, it's a much bigger category than, you know, maybe we give it credit for and, you know, uh, can, can has all of this potential and, and uh, all of this versatility. I, I love the discussion also about the versatility, John, there about how it, it absorbs other elements and sort of makes it part of, a, of, a, of its own structure. And, and that might explain, you know, the popularity there. So um, it's been an absolutely brilliant evening. As I said, the, the, um, the interaction on the chat is absolutely insanely uh, busy. And so is the, the YouTube channel actually as well. So I know we've just about scratched the surface really here. So we'll have to have you back at some point uh, in the future. But uh, can I just thank uh, on behalf of everyone here, and of course we can't do the big clap and applause that we would have done in a big lecture theater, but virtual applause. And thank you ever so much, John, for an absolutely brilliant uh, talk and, and, and your generosity, giving, giving up your time to answer all of those questions. And of course, uh, I'm so grateful to Emma for organizing things and sharing this and to Grace for the brilliant introduction and, and interactive um, session. I mean, I learned a lot today, I learned so much. So this is just to uh, a couple of announcements as per usual. I'm going to put a, a link on the chat if it works for me, I hope. Um, this is uh, the Get Involved uh, tab on the Center for Fantasy and the Fantastic, which will give you links to our mailing list, uh, which means that you'd be the first to find out about new events coming up. Uh, it also gives you links to all of our social media, including groups, uh, our Discord channel, in which I know a discussion is going on right now and can continue. Also there, there's a number of discords actually at a number of different thematic things that you could be involved in. These, these are open to, to everyone, not just uh, University of Glasgow staff and students. I know John has been, you've been playing through discord, haven't you recently? So it's been a great thing uh, during yeah. the, the lockdown. Um, so uh, what's coming up uh, next then is, uh, there's two events coming up in March. We're gonna have a book launch uh, on the 16th of March and that is, um, we're very, very proud uh, that it's uh, by one of our graduates, a graduate of the, the creative writing program here in um, Glasgow, but also a graduate of our fantasy uh, masters. And that's Only Lang Meets Birds of Paradise, and that will be launched on the 16th of March. Uh, there's details on that on the um, uh, forthcoming events tab on the center uh, website and again I'm putting the link to the forthcoming events on the chat right now uh, and also on in March as well this year um, the center is partnering with the Tolkien Society because uh, we'll work together to celebrate Tolkien Reading Day which happens every year on the 25th of March uh, clearly it's, it's impossible during uh, the, this pandemic sort of situation we all live in at the moment to have physical events. So uh, it will be all online. There'll be a lot of opportunities to take part in three different Zoom events on the day, but there's also going to be a lot of interaction videos and, and um, uh, all sorts of other opportunities uh, during the week leading up to the 25th. So um, follow, follow us on social media to find out more about it. Keep keep checking on our pages. And uh, if you want, you know, the, the an email with the information, uh, subscribe to, to the mailing list for that. So one, one last time, thank you everyone. And thank you so much, John, Emma, Grace. It's been an absolutely brilliant event. And thanks to everyone for attending from all over the world. So hopefully we'll see you again uh, in one of our other events. Thank you and good night. Good thank night, you. everyone.